Minister, she will be in the forefront of a campaign to stay in the European Union. But as the SNP leader, she wants a rather different EU from David Cameron. Scotland's government wants migrants and favours the kind of social Europe many Tories disdain. And she joins me now from our Glasgow studio. Good morning to you. Good morning, Andrew. So this is a very important moment for Scotland as well as for the rest of the UK. Um, you've been watching David Cameron's negotiation. What did you make of it? Well, I think the negotiation and the outcome of the negotiation is somewhat immaterial. If, like me, you're passionate about remaining within the European Union, nothing that came out of the negotiation is going to change your mind. Likewise, if you're absolutely determined to vote to leave the European Union, I don't think there's anything there that's going to shift your opinion. I guess if I'm concerned at all about the negotiation, it's that those people who are undecided, who have been encouraged by David Cameron to look at the outcome uh, to base their opinion on, will be disappointed by it because it didn't live up to many of the expectations that he himself created. And that, for me, is all the more reason why it's time to get away from the narrow issues that were uh, involved in that negotiation onto the big picture case. Why is it better for us to remain within the European Union? That's the campaign that I look forward to taking part in. And if an independent Scotland was at the EU table, you would want, presumably, a somewhat different EU than David Cameron does. Well, David Cameron and I will both cast our votes to stay in the European Union on the 23rd of June, but I strongly suspect we've reached that conclusion for very different reasons. David Cameron seems to want an EU where the social and employment protections uh, that it brings are watered down. For me, these are parts of the reasons for being in the EU and actually one of the reasons why it would worry me greatly if the UK was to come out of the European Union is that we would then have David Cameron's majority Conservative government unfettered when it came to employment rights or social protection. So we have a different vision of what the European Union should be and you know perhaps in a referendum that's no bad thing because we'll be able to appeal to different strands of opinion. You're going to get um, almost certainly new, new powers over aspects of fiscal policy in Scotland. That would enable you to top up, as it were, benefits for migrants who came into Scotland. Would you do that? Well, you know, we are in, as you know, the midst of a, a discussion about uh, the fiscal arrangements that will go around that, so that's not uh, settled yet. But, you know, I've got no proposals to do that. We'll put forward our proposals for the use of new tax and uh, welfare powers in the run-up to the Scottish Parliament elections. Um, I, you know, I, I think I, I take a different view in terms of the debate about migration to David Cameron. Yes, of course, people are concerned uh, about migration, but European Union migration into the UK and the evidence shows this actually has a net uh, economic mm. benefit uh, rather than a, an economic detriment. So we take a different view there, uh, but you, I think it's important that the alternative view is heard in this debate. Sure. Do you think what's being done to EU migrants into this country is fair to them? Um, I do think when you start uh, going down this road, uh, I think the danger is the, the freedom of movement that is one of the underpinning principles of the European Union uh, starts to be fragmented. And I'm sure David Cameron would be one of the first to complain if people from the UK who had migrated to other member states of the European Union, and there are many of them, uh, started to be discriminated against. But, you know, what has come out of the negotiation, I, I don't think really adds up to all that much and I don't think it's going to change uh, very many opinions, apart from, as I say, those who are undecided, people who have been encouraged mm. by David Cameron all along to look at the outcome uh, and what he has delivered uh, hasn't lived up to what he said some uh, months ago. Wasn't, wasn't a big enough rabbit. Um, now, can I ch ch ask you about something else we've talked about before, but is now much more um, on the horizon, which is what happens if the UK overall votes to leave the EU, but Scotland doesn't? Would that definitely trigger a Scottish referendum? Almost certainly. I, I think that would be the demand of, of people in Scotland. Now, let me say very clearly, and I've said this to you before, I'll say it again today, I hope this scenario doesn't arise. I it's not the scenario yes. I want to see arise. I hope the UK as a whole votes to stay in the EU for a whole variety of different reasons. But if you cast your mind back to the Scottish referendum, and I would say to uh, the in campaign in this referendum, don't make the same mistakes the no campaign made yeah. in the Scottish referendum by being miserable and negative about everything. But if you cast your mind back to that referendum, the no campaign then said that if Scotland voted yes, our membership of the European Union would be at risk. Now, that was rubbish then, but that was a key argument 
if a couple of years later we find ourselves having voted to stay in the European Union, being taken out against our will, I do think there are many people, including people who voted no in 2014, who would say the only way to guarantee our EU membership is to be independent. And that, I think, is but you inescapable. Pre you presumably don't want this to happen because, among other things, if Scotland was out of the EU as part of Britain and then separated from the UK and went back into the EU, we would then have to have a border between Scotland and England because but England would be outside the EU. There would be a number of aspects of that that would mm. require to be debated in, in the context. But, you know, people in Scotland, and I take nothing for granted about Scottish opinion in this referendum, although all the polls would suggest there will be a significant uh, vote to stay in the European Union. Uh, but I think Scotland's always seen itself as a, a, a European country. My view, as you know, is that we'd be far mm. better served as an independent member state amongst the other independent member states. But uh, I think if we were to be taken out of the European Union when we had expressly said we wanted to stay in, uh, then then that would trigger a demand for a second independence referendum. I know people, and I'm getting anecdotal here, but I personally know people who voted no in 2014, who were passionate in their no vote in 2014, who would change their minds if we were in this scenario. And that, I think, is just something that is inevitable. But as I started out by mm. saying, I'll be campaigning for Scotland to vote to stay in. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody else here in the rest of the UK will want to listen to my opinion, but if they do, I'll be seeking to persuade Absolutely. people across the UK to stay in as well. And I introduced you at the start by saying that you weren't, weren't very often on the same side as David Cameron. You are this time. <laughs> would he be welcome in Scotland? Would you share a platform with him? I'm not sure it would help his cause too much. <laughs> I, I think he should perhaps uh, th think twice uh, about that. I remember during the independence referendum, we used to uh, be overjoyed every time he made a, a foray uh, into Scotland to campaign there uh, because we thought it ratcheted up votes for the, the Yes campaign. So, you know, I, I, I'll be making the case. I'll be making a positive case. But as I said earlier on, my reasons for wanting to be in the EU, I guess, are rather different to David Cameron's in, in many yeah. respects. So perhaps if we uh, okay. appeal to our own strands of opinion, then we will maximise the chances of our, our vote to stay in. A friendly warning there from Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Now to the weather, and it seems to be swinging rather wildly between deep winter and hints of spring. So what's in prospect for today and the week ahead? Over to Jay Wynne in the Minute Colleagues, or it suggested the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. But of course, the most important people he has to win over are the millions of voters who will decide the outcome of this referendum. David Cameron is with me now. Good morning to you. Good morning. Hot foot back from Brussels. You must be knackered. Well, I had a decent night's sleep last night and, uh, you know, I think it was important work. It was important. I want to go through some of the detail of the important work. But before we do, I thought I'd give you the chance. There's two million people watching, probably Boris Johnson as well. Can you tell them why they should be voting to stay in the EU, despite all the things they've heard against it? Well, I want what's best for Britain. And I think what's best for Britain is staying in a reformed European Union because we'll be better off safeguarding our position in this massive the single free market that we have in Europe. I think we'll be stronger in the world, being able to get things done, whether that's uh, making sure our country country is safe and our people are safe and I think we'll fight terrorism and criminality better. Uh, we'll be safer inside the EU because we're able to work with our partners, strength in numbers in a dangerous world. That I think is a positive choice whereas I think uh, a leap in the dark with uncertainty already in our world, why take a further risk? You don't need to. We've now got a better deal. Now, um, in terms of the details of the deal, you did promise before the election that no children of EU migrants would be getting benefits as a result of that. You haven't got that, have you? Well, what we've achieved, which I think is a big achievement, is to say that uh, for new arrivals, they will get child benefit, not at British rates, but at a rate that reflects uh, the cost of living in their country. And for existing people here, uh, over the next few years, we'll move to a system where they get that yeah. lower rate of child benefit too. Now, these are things that many people thought were impossible to achieve, sure. not least your last sure. guest on the programme, who argued for well, we'll, welfare restrictions, said they were very important, we'll, we'll and now come, we've we'll got come, them, seems to we'll say come, they're we'll irrelevant. To, we'll come on to him later on, but I just want to establish for clarity, and in terms of being honest with people watching, what you wanted in the manifesto you haven't quite achieved on child benefit. Well, you said a, no children, however long people had worked, however long they've been here, not at all, and you haven't got well, that. I'm very happy, happy to look at the manifesto, what we promised, getting out of ever closer union, we got out of ever closer union, yep. making sure Sorry, we I'm treat, absolutely, to child it's benefit. a negotiation, but you can see in each case what I asked for and what we got. And we got many things that people said were simply not achievable. Uh, 
Nigel Farage and others said, you'll never get Britain out of ever closer union. And we have. And what this means is the I'll best come, of both I'll come parts. come back to that too. Because we're out of the things we don't want to be in, the Euro, we're mm. out of the no borders agreement, we're now out of ever closer union, but we keep the full access and the say over the single market and the political I to, cooperation I want to, to press keep back our a little bit people in our those. country safe. I want, but, but just yeah. sticking with benefits, the same, the, same, the same is true. We didn't get what we wanted on child benefit or on the overall benefit package for EU migrants coming in because it was going to be four years of nothing and now it's four years of a tapered increasing benefit. Well that's right, what we said we wanted is you shouldn't get something for nothing, you have to pay into our system before you get out of it and you won't get full access to our in-work benefit system till f for four years and what I think I've achieved that is uh, I think even more strong than that is that this mechanism is going to last for seven years. So let's say we get it in place in 2017. But It'll still be operating in 2024 and people won't be getting full benefits till 2028. Now, but they will be getting some. Argue. They will be getting some. I mean, if I'm a Hung imagine me as a Hungarian arriving in this country. How long do I have to work here before I get any benefits at all? Well, if you come here, now, even in 2024, you're not going to get full access to our in-work ah, benefit system until 2028. Sure, you say fool. I'm asking, how long is it before I get anything? Well, what we've set out is that you get nothing to start with and you don't get full access till after four years. And now we have to settle uh, the details and put all that in place, which we will. So we but, don't you know, know, actually. In well, what we know months, is you, get, you get no up. benefits to start with and you don't get full access for four years. No more something for nothing. Everyone has to pay in before they get out. Again, I think something people said we wouldn't achieve and actually something that has been achieved. But, but I would, so, I would far, worry, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, mm. so far as you're aware now, after six months, I could get 90% of benefits. Well, no, it's going to be phased in over four years. So but you we don't, don't know get how the, the full, phase works. Yeah, absolutely, we're going to settle all that uh, later. But it's a very important uh, move because people want a country where there is no something for nothing. You don't come here, immediately claim benefits. You have to mm. pay in uh, first. And I think this is important. The benefits deal is now very, very complicated because we're going to be paying proportion of benefits paid in 27 different countries at different rates at different times. For a work and pensions department, which has struggled to introduce universal credit for six years, is this actually plausible? Yes, it's absolutely doable. It's not a difficult calculation. You just have to work out the relative cost of living in different countries and therefore you pay that level of child benefit. But it does and raise... I Ian think, Duncan Smith agrees with this, does he? Uh, he look, he the, all do of this is deliverable, otherwise I wouldn't have agreed to it and it, I think, uh, meets what we set out uh, in our manifesto, the commitments that we made. But I would make this point, because it was interesting listening to Nigel Farage. If we were to leave the EU and we were to try and insist on full access to the single market, like Norway has, for instance, every other country that's got that sort of deal has had to accept the free movement of people and a contribution to the EU budget. He so ironically... Say, he says that is simply I'll come not on to, I'll, true. Me, I'll come on to that. But So it would be ironic, actually, if we left the EU, negotiated our way back into full access for the single market, and then wouldn't be able to exercise these welfare restrictions that I've just negotiated. Now, what Nigel Farage was saying, and this is important, of course, there is the option of having a trade deal with the EU, mm -hmm. but you can look at all of the trade deals, they do not cover every industry. And this is crucial. Canada has done quite a good one. It's, well, it hasn't been finished, it's been going for seven years, mm -hmm. and I think this goes to the heart of the argument. If we remain in a reformed EU, you know what you're going to get, you know how to do business, you know how to create jobs, you know how to continue with our economic recovery. If we leave, seven years potentially of uncertainty and at the end of that process you still can't be certain that our businesses will have full access to the market so okay. it could cost jobs it could mean businesses overseas businesses not investing in Britain it would be a step into the dark a real risk and uncertainty and that's just the last thing we need in our country right now when it comes to an awful lot of people on the other side of the argument the fundamental question is sovereignty can you look me in the eye or look the camera in the eye and say, as a result of this uh, negotiation, Britain has control over her own laws? Well, absolutely, that what we've got now is getting out of ever closer union. So actually, we're now best of both well, worlds. We are, I'll come on to this sovereignty question because it's so important. It really is. You know, we're going to be uh, in the single market, in the political cooperation to keep our world uh, and our people safe, but out of the projects that we don't like, out of the euro, out of the no borders agreement. Now, on sovereignty, yes, of course, if Britain were to leave the EU, that might give you a feeling of sovereignty, but you've got to ask yourself, is it real? Would you have the power 
to help businesses and make sure they weren't discriminated against in Europe? No, you wouldn't. Would you have the power to insist that European countries share with us their border information so we know what terrorists and criminals are doing in Europe? No, you wouldn't. Would, would if, but, if suddenly a ban okay. was put on for some bogus health reasons on one of our industries, would you be able to insist that that ban was unpicked? No, you wouldn't. So you have an illusion of sovereignty, but you don't have power. You don't have control. You can't get things done. And to me, this is, is in a way, quite simple. You boil it down to, if you love this country, and I love this country so much, you want what's best for it, and you want to make sure we are stronger, we're safer, we're better off, we're able to get things done in the world. That's what this is about. Isn't the, that's really the question we have to answer. Isn't the big truth about this that the old EU with its treaties, the Lisbon Treaty and the Nice mm -hmm. Treaty and all the rest of them, over, overhanging our laws and its uh, over-centralised, massive, blundering machine, imperial in its ambitions, carries on. And because we are still under those treaties, we carry on under it. Well, the difference is that, of course, now we're not only out of the euro, out of the no borders agreement, but we're As also we were. out of ever closer union. So well, we won't are be we? part of it. Because, yes. because this depends upon uh, a treaty of undefined scope at an undefined time with new leaders we don't even know about. So it's taken well, on well, trust. No, hold on. First of all, what was agreed by 28 prime ministers and presidents, every EU country, uh, on Friday evening. That is in itself uh, an international law decision, a treaty that will be deposited at the UN. Uh, it cannot, it is legally mm. binding, it is irreversible. The only way it can be reversed is if all 28 countries, including me, were to turn around and say we don't want this anymore. So, so, so this that's is, not going this to is happen. This exactly what John Major said in 1992 when the Danes got their legally binding and irreversible agreement, which was then destroyed it wasn't, and shredded. Tw 23, the Danish had a protocol to mm. give them some special status in the EU. 23 years on, that special status continues. So Just we have got, bit, bit, not bit only, bit not bit only, bit no, it's, it's survived. Not only have 28 countries made this legally binding decision, but we also have, in two vital areas, uh, the commitment to treaty change. Treaty change to carve Britain out of ever closer union. So we're in the bits of Europe we want to be in, but out of those we don't want to be in. And crucially, and this is a more technical issue, but there's a simplicity at its heart, treaty change to make sure that not only can we keep the, our currency, the pound, forever, but also the pound and our businesses cannot be discriminated against in Europe. And I think this is a really important point because to me, the weakness of the Leave campaign is I think they forget that even if you leave, the EU still exists. It's still on your doorstep. I want to come and on what to I will Absolutely. have with this deal no. is to make sure we can never be discriminated against. Leave the EU and your businesses can be discriminated against, your financial services can be discriminated against, and there's not much you can do about that. But meanwhile, we are under supreme EU law. And that was the point that Michael Gove, now I know he's a friend of yours and you must have been disappointed by his decision, but I think you'd also agree he has put things very, very clearly with characteristic crispness. And so I'm going to read some of them to you and see how you respond. He says that our membership of the EU prevents us being able to change huge swathes of law and stops us being able to choose who makes critical decisions which affect all our lives. Laws which govern citizens in this country are decided by politicians from other nations who we never elected and can't throw out. He's absolutely right, isn't he? Well, first of all, on this sovereignty issue, I mean, we should stand back for a moment and recognise this referendum. This is an enormous act of British sovereignty. This is Britain and British people saying, let's make a choice here. Second point I'd make is, look, sovereignty really means are you able to get things done? Are you able to change things, to fix things? And as I say, well, in the you, end, might means which law, which, you might which feel law more is sovereign. Supreme. You might feel more sovereign, but if you can't get your businesses access to European markets, if you can't keep your people safe, if you can't insist on the passenger information, the terrorist information that we need, then you are not actually more in charge of your destiny. You're less in charge of your destiny. And there is, of course, this crucial point that if you leave the EU and then want full access, unimpeded access to that single market, the other countries have got that, have had to sign up to all the rules of the EU without having a say. So, I mean, after take your, one in... Let's say, yeah. sorry, after your negotiation in Brussels, you suggested that you were going to introduce some new mechanism or law in this country to enhance sovereignty, are you? Yes, uh, we're going to set out in the coming days uh, proposals, as I've announced, I think, before on this programme, mm. uh, to make clear that, you know, the 
British Parliament is sovereign. Uh, we have chosen uh, to join the EU. We could choose to leave uh, the EU, and I think there's a, some important work to, to put that point does on it, back. Does it actually matter? So long as we are under the treaties, there is no law that this Parliament can pass which gets us out of those treaties. We can't declare UDI from those treaties. No, what you can do, though, is just put beyond doubt in people's minds, because sometimes this is question... It's PR, isn't it, really? No, it's, I, th I think it's not. I think for a lot of people it's important. As I say, this is an act of sovereignty holding the referendum, but I think it's important for people to know that in the end what our Parliament does, our Parliament can undo. It is a sovereign Parliament. Look, I what approach all these issues in a very simple way. I am passionate and love the institutions and the constitution we have in our country. I do not love the institutions <laughs> of Brussels, but I make a, a clear-eyed determination of what will make Britain stronger, what will make us safer, what mm. will enable us to pre protect our people in this world. And it's to get the best of both worlds in this uh, amended is, EU. Is it, is it possible to um, give more powers to our Supreme Court to somehow keep back the ever-encroaching world of the European Court of Justice, which, as Michael Gove again says, ministers sit there and they see all this slew of, of legislation and change law coming across their desks and they're told they can't do anything about well, it. There, there is this argument, which our proposals will address, that countries that have written constitutions have sometimes been able not only to assert the sovereignty of their own parliament, as we've just discussed, but actually to go further and say that those constitutional principles have to be taken into account. But we'll, we'll be making this I know, clear. I, I mean, you're, you're trying to get me to pre-announce this on I'm, your programme. You you're going to have to I'm, wait. I'm, I'm going to ask you one, one easy to answer, straightforward, open question about this. Are you suggesting that we need a written constitution in this country? I, I'm not making that argument. I think we shouldn't have to do that in order to give to ourselves what some other countries have managed that inside would be a massive the change, EU. No, that's, I don't think that's no. necessary. But you'll have to wait for the detailed proposals, but I think they're, they're important. All right, let's turn a little bit, if we may, to the politics of this. Um, not only Michael Gove, one of your closest friends, has come out on the other side, Boris Johnson, who's watching this interview, all the drumbeats are this endless dance of the seven veils, seems to be ending up with him going to the Brexit side as well. Um, the Conservative Party, right to the top, is deeply, deeply split on this now, isn't it? Well, we had a very good, uh, very civilised, very dignified Cabinet meeting in which the 29 people who sit round the table, 23, absolutely believe that this... That actually, everyone agreed that the deal made in Brussels was a good deal. Everyone agreed on the referendum. The first and 23 days... of 29 uh, agreed that Britain is better off in a reformed European Union. But, of course, people like uh, Michael and Ian Duncan Smith, you know, all their political lives have believed particularly Michael, that uh, Britain would be better off uh, outside the EU. So that's why we have this position in place, that people can campaign in a personal capacity. Obviously, you know, I'm sad that a close friend is going to be mm. on the different side of this, this argument, but, you know, we respect each other's uh, positions, positions and we'll, we'll uh, you know, make the case accordingly. As for to Boris, I'd say He's to Boris... He's watching. You to Boris, I would say... Him, to, well, talk to him directly. Well, I He's would watching. say to Boris what I say to everybody else, which is that we will be safer, we'll be stronger, we'll be better off inside the EU. I think the prospect of you know, linking arms with Nigel Farage and George Galloway and taking a leap into the dark is the wrong step for our country. And if Boris and if others really care about being able to get things done in our world, then the EU is one of the ways in which we get them done. We're members of NATO, we're members of the UN, we're members of the IMF. I care about Britain being able to fix stuff. Now, whether it's stopping pirates off the African coast, whether it's closing down mm. illegal migration routes and closing down the smugglers, whether it's standing up to Vladimir Putin with sanctions, whether it's the sanctions we put in place to get Iran to abandon its nuclear program, having that seat at the table in the EU just as being a member of NATO is a vital way that we project our values and our power and our influence in the world. And I don't say this for it's any exercise of national vanity. This is about sure. our national interest. That, you know, Britain, this amazing country, fifth largest economy in the world. We can succeed whatever we do. But if you ask me, having sat here as Prime Minister for six years, how will we be safer, stronger, better off, in or out, I'm absolutely clear, we'll be better off in, and I'm going to take that message around the country for the next four months. If the British people make a contrary decision, I will do everything in my power to implement it as okay. best I can. But I'm let absolutely me, me, clear that, after the, the years that I've spent in this job that this is the right thing for Britain to do.
you have bust a gut on this negotiation. You've tried very, very hard. And it's beginning to look as if behind you there is a very, very carefully coordinated campaign of Brexit people working against you. Do you feel in any sense betrayed? You've been out there and you feel knives in your back as you head back through the tunnel. No, that's not, not at all, actually. The Cabinet meeting yesterday was, um, uh, mm. was, I say, very dignified. And everybody said, first of all, they backed the referendum, they backed the date. Everyone also said they thought the deal improved on the status quo because it's undeniable we're going to be able to stop people's welfare benefits. It's undeniable that we're out of ever closer union. One of the, the, this crucial point of making sure not just we keep our currency, but British firms can never be discriminated against while there is this parallel currency, the euro. These are really important for the future of our country. But of course, you know, in the Conservative Party, as in the Labour Party, and you heard it with Kate Hoey, you have some people who've always believed sure. Britain's better off out. I think it is a risk. I think it's uncertainty. I think it's a leap in the dark, and I think it would actually weaken our ability to get things done, our sovereignty, and, as and it the, were, rather than strengthen And it. the choice is not very far away. If we do leave the EU, if Brexit happens, these are sort of dangerous times economically and in other ways as well. What do you think happens to the rest of the EU? Does it come, carry on unchanged? Well, I think it would lose, obviously, one of its strongest players. One of its, one, it would lose the country that argues the most for free trade deals that argues the most for a competitive so single market. But you know, it wouldn't go away. I think this in a way is one of the weaknesses of the, the case for, for leaving is this idea, I think Patrick McLaughlin put it brilliantly at Cabinet yesterday. He, he, mm. he said in a way perhaps only uh, he could, look, I'd love to live in Utopia too, but I've got a feeling when we get to Utopia, we'll find the EU will still be there. And that's the point, because in the yeah. end, this is a hard-headed calculation about what's best for Britain, for British people. How do we create jobs? How do we safeguard livelihoods? How do we fight terrorism? How do we make sure in a very dangerous world we're strong in, in the West and we have strength in numbers? In, in a world where you've got Putin to the east and ISIL, Daesh to the south. How do you stay strong? You stay strong by sticking with your neighbouring countries, your partners and your friends. Yes, this organisation is imperfect. Has it got better? Yes. Is there still a lot more to do to improve it? Absolutely. And the ref case for reform doesn't end. But if you leave the EU, the EU will stop reforming. In my view, it would probably get worse. And that actually would impact us very badly. Because right. if we're outside the EU... The euro goes on as a currency with yes, its okay, problems. The okay. migration crisis let, let goes me, on. Let me take you back to this not. unhappy prospect of Britain voting to leave the EU, and everything's on a knife edge. No one knows what's going to happen. Um, last time we spoke, um, I asked you whether you would stay on as Prime Minister, and you said, in effect, you bet. Hmm. But if that happened, you would go down in history as the man who let, got Britain out of the EU against your own will. That would be a ca catastrophic um, thing to have on your on well, your CV, I stood, as it were. and the whole Conservative Party stood on a very clear manifesto of a promise I made three years ago that we would have a renegotiation and hold a referendum. And we are meeting those commitments. The renegotiation is now complete after exhaustive work, travelling right across Europe, meeting every single Prime Minister and President, getting a better deal for Britain, and now we meet the commitment to hold this referendum. And the people are sovereign. We talk about sovereignty. Mm. Well, the people of our country are going to make a sovereign decision. They're going to instruct their Prime Minister either to stay in a reformed European Union and fight for Britain's interests in that way, or to leave. And I will you know, meet their instruction and answer their instruction, whatever it is. That's my job. Michael Gove, Bojo, uh, Zach Goldsmith, they're falling away one by one. Do you think you're losing this? Not at all. I think, you know, you've got the overwhelming majority of the Cabinet backing that the, the we're better off to remain in a reformed European Union. You're going to see, you know, I, I'm sure some people try and paint it as the establishment against, you know, the sort it of will. rebel alliance. Well, you don't get much more establishment than the Lord Chancellor and the leader of the House of Commons. And frankly, I've got many things to say about Jeremy Corbyn, but I don't think I'd describe him as a member of the establishment. I mean, on, on my side of the argument there will be you know the Green Party the Liberal Democrats most of the Labour Party trade unionists who not always do I have a huge amount you happy about this agree. yeah because in yes because in the end this question is so much bigger than any political party or any politician it's about the future of our country for our children and our grandchildren what sort of country do we want to live in I would say let us have a big bold Britain doing great things in the world right. in these organizations 
making us stronger, more prosperous and safer. Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed. That's all we've got time for this morning. Thanks to the Prime Minister and all my guests. On the Sunday Politics in an hour, Joe Coburn will be talking to the pro-Brexit Cabinet Minister Chris Grayling and the Shadow Foreign Secretary Hilary Benn. Join me again at the same time next week, but for now, a very good morning. The waking us up. Good morning.